So now I will like to call Akash for his next talk. So Akash will be giving a talk on supply chain security for dummies and Akash Gautam is a consultant at Kubermatic. In this session he will talk about the supply chain security risks attack uh, changes and more things related to that. All right then. Uh, so a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, my name is Akash Gautam. Currently I work as a consultant at Kubermatic. Uh, so the agenda for this talk is to discuss uh, software supply chain and uh, supply chain security. And as the title suggests, we will be just uh, touching upon the surface of a very complex problem uh, that software supply chain security is, right? So supply chain is something, uh, supply chain is traditionally associated with manufacturing in the industry, right? So whenever we need to produce any goods, we bring all the raw materials together in the, our manufacturing unit produce the good and then that goods get uh, distributed to the end user or retailers, right? So let's start with example of a manufacturing, uh, manufacturing industry, right? Uh, so for example, consider that we, we are a small company that produces cookies. We are producing organic cookies. So in that case, how our supply chain will roughly look like? So we are uh, growing organic uh, wheat ourselves so that we get the wheat flour then other raw materials that we need, for example, sugar comes from a different vendor. Similarly, dry fruits may come from another vendor. Uh, the milk powder may come from another vendor. Then everything, we bring all those things in our manufacturing unit, we put them together and the baking process starts. And once our cookie is ready, we put it through some, quali put it through some quality gates and then ultimately we package it and then distribute it, right? So if we, if we draw parallels from this to how a software application is developed, we will see that at a high level, it will look very similar. So when we start developing any applications, first the developer start writing the code specific to the application, but while doing so, they import many packages which are developed by the community or by other companies, right? And in many cases, we also use uh, open source libraries or, or use some open source code. And not to forget the code snippets we take from Stack Overflow, right? And then all those things are put together in the version control system, which then triggers a build, uh, which, and then the build process happens, which produces the artifact, and in case of Kubernetes, the Docker image. This Docker image is then put in, in an image registry from where it gets uh, pulled and deployed on the intended clusters. So this entire process of write, write, since the beginning of, uh, since, the, uh, since the developer start writing the code till the point where the code uh, gets deployed on a cluster, this entire process forms the supply chain, supply chain or the software supply chain. The actual steps in the software supply chain can vary depending upon the organization, depending upon the nature of the application, but at a very high level, the three major phases that we see is the code level, then there is a build level and there is a deploy level, right? So for securing our supply chain, what we can do, we can try to secure these three major phases and hope that our supply chain in general is uh, secure enough, right? So now we will look at each of these three high level phases separately and see what challenges we face and what potential solution uh, we, can, uh, we can make. So let's first look at the code level. So what risk we are facing at the code level? So one of the uh, very common risk is package poisoning, right? So in this, in this what happens is that the attackers, they introduce malicious code in some well-known packages. And if the developers are not careful, they end up uh, importing those packages. And an example of this type of attack is, uh, some, is, uh, is a package called Koa. So Koa is a very popular NPM package. Uh, it used to get downloaded more, more than a million times every week. And there was no development on this package for like three years. But then suddenly new versions started appearing and it was later identified that these new versions had some malicious code that could, that could steal passwords. Another kind of attack we see at package level is package typo squatting. So typo squatting is something which is traditionally associated with uh, domain names. So what attackers used to do, they used to purchase uh, domain names which are common misspelling of popular domains. For example, if you have, uh, if you, you are using HDFC Bank, the attacker will create a domain HDFC Banks, 
and these kind of things uh, which the user may overlook and end up using it instead of the legitimate one, right? And something similar is now happening with various packages like NPM package or, or Python packages that attackers create packages which look very similar to the legitimate ones, making common spelling changes here and there. And then they also use bots to put reviews and ratings so the package looks legitimate and if the developers are again not careful, they end up using the wrong ones. And the third risk that we have is the poor code quality. So if we, if the developer themselves write the poor code uh, quality, then that can be also exploited by the attacker. Uh, let's take a look at what potential remedies we can take. And the first thing is like follow secure coding practices. Uh, then use quality and code analysis tools. So there are many tools that checks, uh, that does the code analysis, static code analysis. And then there are tools that scans our code for any security vulnerabilities. So we should use those tools and whatever result they produce, we should try to work on that. And then we can follow practices like using encrypt encrypting any secrets that we have, uh, like the database password or API key or some li license uh, we are using. And this is applicable to our code as well as the infra code, like the Terraform files or the Helm charts. And also we should follow some kind of procedure while updating the packages. So whenever new, we need to update the packages, we should encourage the developer to look at the change logs, look at what new uh, feature or bug fixes has been added, maybe take a rough look at the code itself, and then make an informed decision whether they want to upgrade to the package or not, rather than just blindly updating the version and pulling the package. Another thing that helps greatly with this uh, is the privately hosting package. So instead of pulling the packages from the internet, we can host a mirror of the repository in our private network and use packages from there. And then from time to time, sync it with the upstream mirror. Uh, sorry, upstream repo. Uh, now look at, now let's look at the risk we have at the build level. So at build level, one of the major risk is any software that we are hosting or, or the server underlying infrastructure, if there is any misconfiguration there which allows attackers to gain access to the build environment, then uh, they can inject some malicious code or they can leak some information which are sensitive, right? So one example of this kind of attack is uh, Dialmul's GitLab. So Dialmul is a company which is owned by Mercedes Benz and they have had a self-hosted GitLab instance. And what they did is uh, they, it, they, this GitLab instance allowed a user even with an invalid uh, corporate email access to the GitLab instance. And the attackers downloaded more than 500 private repositories having proprietary code and published it on the internet. So in this kind of mis misconfiguration can happen with our Argo CD server or our Jenkins servers if we are not doing proper hardening, right? Another risk that we have is the, the compromised build tools. So any dependency that we have at the build level, if that dependency itself is compromised. One example of this is the CodeCov. So CodeCov is a popular uh, code coverage tool and the attackers compromised the CodeCov itself and, and planted a malicious code which used to read all the environment variables and pass it on to a server owned by the attackers. And this, this impacted more than 25,000 organizations. Another major risk we have is some kind of code injection. So yeah, so once the attackers gain access to our build environment, they can inject some malicious code which gets built as a part of, of the application we are de uh, developing and then it can get deployed on our uh, production or the end user clusters. Uh, so for this, the famous uh, solar wind attack you guys might have heard of. So here, uh, uh, attackers got access to SolarWinds uh, network and they planted a malicious code in one of their tools which then made its way to uh, many of their customer including the US government. So what remedies we can take uh, at the bid level? So one of the thing is the hardening of the in infrastructure. So what happens is that uh, many a time uh, the infrastructure which is not hosting a user facing application, it doesn't get the same amount of uh, attention that uh, that it deserves, right? But from a supply chain security point of view, the build infrastructure is also critical. So we should do proper hardening of the infra infrastructure we have uh, where we are hosting our build softwares. And then we should do proper hardening of the tool themselves, like use proper access, con take advantage of access, access control, provide granular access to, uh, to uh, individuals. Uh, rather than just creating one user and sharing it with 10 people, right? So we should avoid things like that. And then just like packages, we should also follow some procedure while upgrading these tools, 
what, whatever dependency we have, when we update it, we should follow some procedure like, again, going through the change logs or looking at if there is any known vulnerability already, right? And again, we, uh, just like we do for the you know, our production infra, we should also have some kind of maintenance cycle for our build environment as well. Uh, it, it doesn't need to be very regularly, but maybe something like once every quarter, we should just look whether our build environment needs any kind of maintenance or upgrade. Another thing we can do uh, is like make our builds completely offline. Uh, so whatever dependency we have, we can get them in our uh, private network and perform the builds offline. And this is something like more and more organizations have started considering. Uh, even we uh, received requests from a uh, couple of customers last year to get their whole Kubernetes clusters provisioning process offline. Uh, then comes the deploy phase. So at deploy phase, we have a couple of risks. Uh, one is like artifact integrity. So even if we follow all the procedure uh, properly till the uh, creation of our artifact, it doesn't guarantee that it is still free from any known vulnerabilities. And then another challenge is that the source integrity, uh, whether the artifact we are deploying, does it actually come from the source from where we intended to uh, fetch it, right? So what steps we can take? Yeah, the scanning of images, which is becoming a common place now. So we should scan the images before deploying them and see if they have any known vulnerabilities. And if they do, then we should try to fix them. We can also use lighter images, which has lesser number of packages and dependencies installed. Uh, we can also consider building distro-less images, which is, again, um, many organizations are considering. Uh, then we can start signing our images. So whenever we deploy, once our image is ready, we should sign it. And then before deploying the image, we can verify the signature, right? So we can be sure that it's coming from the internet source. And whatever, uh, uh, if we are using images from other vendors, we should also request them also to sign their images and then verify the signature. Another uh, development that's happening in this phase is software bill of material or SBOMs. So falling back to the uh, cookie uh, manufacturing outlet example we, uh, we discussed. Uh, so once we package our cookies, we will have to provide what in ingredients it has, right, uh, in the package. So SBOMs are something similar to that, but for softwares. So one of the major challenge in, challenges in supply chain security is there are so many layers. And because of the, the, those layers, the visibility gets uh, lost, right? Uh, because suppose I'm uh, using software from organization A, which intern is using something from B, and which, something, which intern is using something from D. And for some reason, I don't trust the organization D. So how I get to know that I am deploying something from organization D just by looking at the software I'm receiving from organization A? So those kind of visibility is a big challenge in supply chain security. And so SBOMS uh, is an uh, attempt to address those, like get more visibility into what layers the software has. And there are different SBOM uh, formats. So it is still early days for SBOMS, but they also help us in uh, get providing information of what things are there in the software we are using so that we can make a more informed decision whether we want to deploy that software or not. Uh, yeah. And so supply chain security is not a problem which is limited to one or two organizations, right? Be, uh, and one in, in one of the reports I read that uh, between 2019 to 2022, which is last year, the supply chain attacks increased by 700%. So it is a threat which is common to all to, to the software industry, right? So to address this, what uh, the industry is doing, they are trying to establish some kind of guidelines. They are coming together and uh, establishing a commonly accepted uh, practices. And one of that, these attempt is called uh, supply chain levels for software artifacts, uh, SLSA, or it is also pronounced as SALSA. So what this is, this is basically a kind of framework or a guideline, or maybe you can you know, think of it as a checklist, basically. So what they do, they specify high level steps that you should follow in your supply chain. And then based on that, what, what things you are doing currently, you, you, assign, you can assign yourself a label. And they also specify the steps that you can follow to reach the next level. So you can use this as, as, a, as a guideline to uh, see where you stand in terms of supply chain security. And then take gradual steps to reach the um, best possible stage. And yeah, and this, and this SLSA is useful while producing as well as consuming software. So while consuming, it, it has guidelines for consuming software because as we saw in, a, in the examples, while we are uh, producing software, then also we are consuming software prepared by other organization or open source communities. 
Yeah. So, yeah. So this is all I had to discuss. So if if there are any questions, we can take them. Uh, thank you, Akash, for these insightful sessions.